Back in the Word of God today, we're going to continue our series of preparing for the end days. Now, last time we talked about that first earth age when Satan no longer wanted to be a protective cherubim. He wanted to be God. He fell and he took a third of God's children with him. Instead of our Heavenly Father destroying a third of his children, he destroyed that age, which brings us to the flesh age that we are in right now. So let's get into this. But before we get started, of course, we need to go to our Heavenly Father asking for words of wisdom in Jesus Christ's precious, precious name. Now, as we go in and we're studying, we're going to identify, of course, who the enemy is for the end days. The Antichrist, we've already talked about many times, is Satan. When we are going into Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, we're talking about the locust army. They have a king over them who is the angel of the bottomless pit. That is Satan. His name is given in two uh, languages, Ababdon in the Hebrew and Apollyon in the Greek. That is a destroying angel. That is Satan. So when we look and we see that man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, the son of perdition, we're talking about Satan. The original sin was Satan no longer wanted to be that protective cherubim because pride set in. He wanted to be God, still wants to be God. He's got most of the world following him right now. So let's go over to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to pick it up at verse 7. We're going to talk about the different roles that Satan plays. I don't want anyone to be deceived because we know that Satan plays many different roles. Now when we talk about these roles and different titles that he has accordingly, I want you to keep into mind uh, when we're talking about symbolically a man. A man to his father is a son. To his wife, he is a husband. To his children, he is a father. To his employer, he is an employee. He's one person, but he has several different roles he plays and several different titles that he has in concordance with each uh, role that he is observing. So when we go in and we start reading about Satan and the different names that he has, he's one entity. He has a lot of different roles he plays, but remember he is one en entity, the fallen angel. Who is Satan? Lucifer, that old dragon called the devil. Let's get into it. Let's read it and document it. Revelation chapter 12 verse 7. We're going to read 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there any place found any more in heaven. So Michael is holding Satan right now in heaven. That old dragon, who is just another name for Satan, went to war against Michael. Satan and his angels fought against Michael. This is future to us. Has not happened as of the recording of this date. Uh, Satan and his angels went and fought against uh, Michael, they prevailed not. Satan and his fallen angels, y'all, they're losers. They're absolute losers. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this verse shows us that Satan goes by many different names, and these are just a few. When we talk about the dragon, the serpent is what his name was called in the Garden of Eden. Now remember, he was a protective cherubim. He was in the mountain of God. He walked up and down the mountain of God. And then he fell. Now when you see that he fell, went to the earth, and as a slithering snake, that is the lowest, doesn't even have legs, it just slithers in the dust, is symbolic of his fall from a walking upon the mountain of God to the lowest creature ever, Hebraism, if you will, on the face of the earth. But we know that in a couple more verses down that Revelation chapter 12, what, what happens when Satan is going to be cast down here? Revelation 12, 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. That is going to be the hour of temptation, the tribulation of the Antichrist. Satan is coming, guys. He's coming to sit in the holy place claiming to be God. Now, I do not all understand everything about angelics. I will first and foremost tell you that because it's a different dimension, a different substance. But I do know angelics have substance. They have weighted mass. So when we're talking about them, think about this. The food that sustained angels also sustain man and the food that sustains 
man also sustains angelics. Let's document it. I'm going to go over to Genesis chapter 19. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. This is when Lot, who is the nephew of Abraham, was sitting at the gate of Sodom, and two angels came. Now remember, Sodom is uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, both are very evil, wicked, perverted places. And Lot is sitting there, and he sees these two angels coming. We'll pick it up right there. Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Verse 2, And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray. I pray you into the servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now think about this. They are in a very wicked, perverted place. Evilness everywhere. And they're saying, we're going to stay out here in the street. And Lot knows what kind of people there are in this city. So he presses the issue. Verse 3. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. They ate what sustains a flesh body, they partook of it, and did eat. Now let's go over to uh, Exodus chapter 16, verse 35. We know the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, that they partook of manna. Manna means, what's that in the Hebrew? But it was the angel's food. Let's go over and read it. Exodus chapter 16, verse 35, and it reads, And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came into the land inhabited, and they did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. So this is just to show that I don't understand the substance that an angelic has, but I know that we are extremely similar. Now, angelics aren't going to be beings with wings on them. That is foretold of a lot. And many people think that Satan looks like this. But in fact, he probably is going to look more like this. But I want to tell you this. When we are talking about Satan, who is supernatural, he's beautiful, coming and sitting in the holy place, claiming to be God, you know, my opinion is how he is going to do this to deceive the whole world. Remember, Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 says, the whole world wandered after the beast. How is he going to do this? I believe, and when we see AI and technology increasing, he is going to be able to appear to whatever group, race, ethnicity, or nationality of a person. He will appear to be a pretty boy of that particular people. Now, that is my opinion. But how is he going to get the whole world to follow him? And I also believe of different religions around the world, he is going to claim to be their particular savior. He is going to deceive the whole world. Now, how does Satan work? What does he do? Now, to, to be able to understand how things are going to work out in the end, we've got to go to the beginning again. We're going to go into Genesis chapter 3. We have gone from the first earth age. We are now in the flesh age. Satan is called serpent here. Remember, that's just a Hebraism that is a, a, deg- a title of degradation, the lowest of low. He is in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. So let's pick it up there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Now in Hebrew, that is 5175, snake is nakosh. And that is from its his. And I want you to think about when we are uh, telling a secret or we're wanting people to quietly move about you know when we go shh that is like a type in my opinion a type of hiss now let's go into the prime of this word a prime root meaning properly to his that is to whisper a magic spell generally to prognosticate satan's supernatural we're talking about an angelic being here we're not talking about a literal snake we are talking about a supernatural beautiful angelic being now when you see uh, and he said unto the woman yea hath god said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden now this tree here is at now hold on to that thought we'll get to it more in verse six let's keep reading verse two and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden god hath said ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die now when it says touch here that is um naga in the hebrew now when you look at this word is h5060 to touch literally or when it's used as a euphemism, we're talking about using as symbolic or a metaphor. It is used as a euphemism to lie with a woman. Now, what is a euphemism? That is just how to say something that is very harsh and very blunt to use easy words to describe a certain thing. Uh, for instance, when someone passes away, when they die, we don't say they, they're dead. We simply say they've passed on or they've passed away. That is a euphemism to describe softly a harsh reality so when we we're seeing touch here that is just being used as a euphemism as to lie with a woman verse 4 and the serpent said to the woman ye shall not surely die satan is such a liar he is the deceptor of all deceivers he is such a liar remember that because we're going to talk about it again in just a few minutes. Verse four, 5, For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, he is simply telling Eve, if when you partake of me, you are going. your eyes will be open, and you will know good and evil. Satan is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was in that garden. Verse 6, and the woman, excuse me, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now I'm going to put these up here for you. Like I said, Etz is in your Strong's Concordance, H686. That is just a, a simple tree, wood. Now, if you go into the prime, that is 6095, is a primitive root to fasten or to make firm, that is to close the eyes shut. And if you go on into 6096, that is um, the spine as given firmness to the body as the backbone, as a back. Now, think about this. We're talking about trees, but it's, it's more in depth than just a tree. Now, remember throughout the Word of God, when we talk about you will know a tree by their fruits, we're talking about you'll know a person or an organization by the fruits they pr produce. Uh, when we were talking about Jesus Christ, who is, who out of the root of Jesse, I'm going to go over there and read that, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. We're talking about the prophecy of Jesus Christ coming. Now, out of the root of Jesse, Jesse was the father of David. Out of that bloodline, our Savior would come. So we are saying trees, but always through the Word of God, not, I won't say always, but a lot of times in the Word of God, they are symbols of people. Let's go back into Genesis. Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 7. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, they sewed these fig leaves together. These figs, now, we are to know the parable of the fig tree. This is the beginning of the parable of the fig tree. Right here, when they sewed those fig leaves and made an apron, they didn't cover their mouth because they ate an apple. They covered their private parts because they had committed a sexual sin. Verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Verse 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Again, you know, partaking of an apple or a, a fruit, a literal fruit, is not going to make someone know from previously they were naked as a jaybird to now that is a shameful thing. We're talking about a sexual sin that had occurred. 
Verse 11, And he said, Who said? The Lord said, And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Verse 12, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So we got the blame game going on here. And Adam is very close to even blaming the Lord God Almighty. He said, That woman that you gave me caused me to sin. Verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now, I'm going to put this word beguiled up here. I'm going to put it in the Hebrew and the Greek because we're going to verify it when we go into the New Testament. It's nasha, that is, to lead astray, that is, to delude, to seduce. So, Eve was seduced. And when we go over into the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, this is Paul teaching. Now, listen to the words he says. This is Paul saying, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, what is a chaste virgin? That is someone who has stayed faithful to Jesus Christ, waiting for his return. When uh, Jesus Christ said to the women, Woe unto those women who are with child, and to those who give suck in the end days. He was talking about those who are spiritually impregnated with the doctrine of Satan when he comes claiming to be God, sitting in the holy place, and the whole world follows and wonders after him. And that suckling is working and doing the work of the new religion that's coming. So Paul says, I'm going to read it again, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 3, But I fear, least by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, beguiled in the Greek is to seduce holy. So we are talking about an actual seduction for us in the end days, we are to wait on Jesus Christ. It is a spiritual seduction. With Eve, it was a physical seduction. Now, why would Satan do such a thing? Because through Eve, uh, Jesus Christ, through that bloodline, now it's going to be through Seth, because Abel was killed by Cain. But through that bloodline, that is the the line in which Jesus Christ would come. Now let's go back over to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Again, this is a total sentence of degradation for Satan. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Enmity is strife, hatred, contention, war. God says, I will put war, enmity, hatred between thee and the woman, between Satan and the woman, and between thy seed. Satan has seed line here. That is posterity. That is children and her seed. It shall, should read, he shall, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Who is that? He shall bruise thy head. When Satan is done with, after the great white throne judgment, he will be cast into the lake of fire to be blotted out for eternity. He's a goner. That is the bruising of his head. Now, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is when those people of the church, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the high and mighty people of the church who had our Lord and Savior brought up before Pilate to be crucified. These are the Kenites. These are those in Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, and chapter 2, verse 9, who say they are of our brother Judah, but do lie, and are of the synagogue of Satan. Explained very well, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 55, the Kenites are the house of Rahab. These are Cain's folks. These are the offspring of Cain. Cain was the offspring of the gathering together between uh, Satan and Eve. Now, did Jesus Christ teach this? He absolutely did, and we're going to go over there and read it. We're going to read it, the parable first. We're going to go and read the tares, the parable of the tares of the field. Jesus Christ is teaching here. I'm going to simply read the parable, and then 
the interpretation that Jesus Christ gives us. So let's go over to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to pick it up at verse 24, and it reads, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now I'll put this up here. Um, tares in Arabic is zawan. It is a bitter, poisonous, black weed. And it's sowed among the tares, the good wheat. Now, let's keep listening. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hast it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then go, that we... Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Verse 29. But he said, Nay, least while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Verse 30. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat unto my barn. Now we're going to go down just a little bit further. We're going to be here in Matthew chapter 13, and Jesus Christ is going to explain, interpret this parable. We're going to pick it up at verse 36, Matthew chapter 13, and it reads, Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So the disciples did not even understand what he was talking about. Verse 37, He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That is none other than our Lord and Savior. Verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Well, who is the wicked one? Verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. So, Satan, the wicked one, just another name. When we refer to the wicked one, we're talking about that same entity, the old dragon called the devil, and Satan, the serpent, all the different names he goes by. It's just another name, folks. That's just another name. Verse 40. As therefore the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. Now, people, even, even Kenites, even those people who follow Satan right now still have an opportunity to call upon our Lord and Savior. When, when a person believes upon Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, God with us, who came here in the flesh to overcome the one who is power of death, and that is to say the devil. When we believe upon Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we go to him, we go to our Lord God Almighty, and we repent. We ask for forgiveness. We change our ways. We have a change of heart. We do things and we live differently. Then we can be saved. We can go into eternal life. And even at this point, the Kenites, the tares, whatever you want to call them, the synagogue of Satan, they have the opportunity right now to believe upon Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and be saved. Let's keep reading. Verse 42, And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, therefore sh there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, God with us, who came here in the flesh, and I was alluding to uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, just like we had to come here in the flesh, he, Jesus Christ also came here in the flesh, that through his death, he could overcome the one who is power of death. And the belief upon and the knowing that Jesus Christ is the true Son of God, who is Emmanuel, God with us, anyone who believes and repents can be saved. Now, another place that Jesus Christ, he was calling out the people of the church, the high and mighty people of the church, the Pharisees and the scribes, they came to him and, of course, uh, doing what they do, uh, fighting and having that war, that consternation, that enmity, because they don't love our Lord and Savior. They had him crucified. But Jesus Christ calls them out in John chapter 8, verse 44. Let's read it. 
John chapter 8, verse 44, and it reads, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of, a, speaketh of his own. For he is a liar, and the father of it. Right there, Jesus Christ is calling these Kenites out, the synagogue of Satan people. They're with us still. They are pulling the strings on the four hidden dynasties of education, finance, government, and they're in the churches, folks. you got to know that. How they work, you will know a tree, a tree by the fruit that they bear. Nothing new under the sun. A repetition of things over and over again. But what we are looking forward to now is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But remember, our Heavenly Father is long-suffering. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to wrap it up again with this verse. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, and it reads, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. But he is long suffering, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, that but that all should come to repentance. Our Heavenly Father loves his children. He does not want any of them to perish. So that's gonna be it for today, guys. I hope you liked today's teaching. If you did, like, share, and subscribe, and let's get the word out. I hope you have a great day and join us again.